I'm going to introduce a little bit about what we do here at European Expo and set it up then for Stefan to continue on uh, how our different processes and systems require a lot of teamwork and uh, how to maintain sustainability throughout the focus of, uh, of our operation. So here's the uh, here's the introduction. On the bottom right here, we actually have a, we have a picture of the facility. And so this is a picture of the building we're actually in right now. And we're located just outside of Hamburg in Germany. Now, the facility itself is actually several kilometers long. And so we start where we generate our electrons in Barenfeld in Hamburg proper. And uh, this is led by DAISY, um, the, uh, the synchrotron radiation, uh, German synchrotron radiation research facility there. We then propagate the electrons and we accelerate them up to almost relativistic energies. And then we use them to generate photons. And so we use them to generate X-rays in this case, both soft and hard. And you can see that we're located down here in Schoenefeld. And uh, this is then in a, actually a different state of the German Republic. And so we're in Schleswig-Holstein. And so you can see we go underneath the suburbs of Hamburg. And this is quite a large scale project. Now, the goal of the facility is, is to generate ultra short, ultra brilliant X-ray pulses for researchers to use for their experiments. So we are a user facility as uh, has been mentioned during some of the previous discussion points, which means that we work closely with international researchers who come here to do experiments. And so this means that week to week, we are doing all sorts of different science and we measure with all sorts of different countries. We're a European facility, which means we're funded by these countries down at the bottom here. And the goal is of course, to try to do world leading research in a variety of fields, using the, the different unique aspects of our facility. And one item I'd like to highlight is this so-called burst mode. So we come through with several hundred pulses separated by about a microsecond. Um, and then we have a long gap in between these bursts. And this allows us to deliver a, an enormous amount of average X-ray flux. So on the order of uh, 10 to the 14 or 10 to the 15 X-rays per second. And per pulse, we're generating on the order of about 10 to the 12 X-rays. And so for a lot of measurements, this is, uh, this is an ideal source. And so we get research coming from physics, material science, chemistry, biology, geosciences. Uh, week to week, we work with a broad range of different kinds of uh, researchers from all over the world. And we're a relatively young facility. So we, we got our first X-rays in 2017, and we had these different branches come online. Um, we generally measure uh, on three different branches of the, of the accelerator. And so this means that at any given moment, we have three experiments running with, uh, with our colleagues and collaborators. Uh, we cover the range from the soft X-rays. So this would be say a few hundred electron volts out to very hard X-rays, 25 keV, which means that we can do research um, looking at a variety of different elements in the periodic table from carbon all the way through up to molybdenum. And because we can work simultaneously with these three different, uh, these three different branches, we can also host a number of different parallel experiments. We have a number of instruments that are then installed on, uh, on the facility. They cover a broad range of science. And so I'm not gonna go into significant detail here for these different instruments, but we measure ultra fast dynamics. So we look at very fast time scale events, usually initiated by a short optical laser pulse. Uh, we do single particle imaging where we focus the X-rays down into very small volumes of space. And then we scatter off of material science or biological targets. We do a technique called X-ray photon correlation spectroscopy, which looks at the changes between the scattering events from our coherent X-ray beam from pulse to pulse. We do high energy density. And so this involves compressing or exciting materials into very non-equilibrium states, and then using the X-rays to probe this. We do a soft X-ray nonlinear spectroscopy. So we take advantage of the fact that we have very short and very brilliant X-ray pulses to excite states that are not normally accessible from continuous or, or less, um, less intense X-ray pulses. And we do a fair amount of uh, soft X-ray measurements on ultrafast dynamics. 
We also have a new instrument which focuses on doing experiments using techniques such as angular resolved photo emission spectroscopy. And so on the whole, you can think of the European XBEL as providing a, a broad range of different measurement techniques and different sample environments to study all forms of different research. Now I'm gonna highlight a little bit the instrument that I work at, the femtosecond X-ray experiments instrument, just to give you a sense as to the scope and the, the scale of these different kinds of experiments. This is a, a 3D model of the inside of the X-ray hutch. And it's meant to just give you an overview of the complexity of the different systems. So the X-rays come in from the right, they go through a number of different elements to focus or attenuate or to measure the X-ray beam. We focus them then onto a sample, which could be a solid or liquid. And then we probe it using the X-ray um, tools that we have available, including large detectors or spectrometers. And we also have access to a broad range of laser wavelengths to photo excite the sample. And so this is the sort of environment that, uh, that you would take advantage of were you to come do an experiment here with us. And just to emphasize the complexity, this means that uh, for any given measurement, we require control over the sample environment. So we could potentially require vacuum or we could require helium or a neutral environment, oxygen free, for example, for chemically sensitive samples. We work with liquids, we work with solids, we work in transmission geometry, which is what this movie is showing, where we shoot the X-rays at these thin metal films and destroy them. And we make the measurement before the destruction occurs. We need sophisticated X-ray detectors to measure the X-ray pulses um, as they come out of the machine. We need online data analysis. We need X-ray spectrometers with large degrees of motion control. So each one of these spectrometers requires about 20 or 30 degrees of motorized freedom. And then we need to synchronize it in order to be able to change these things all simultaneously. And then we need a broad range of laser excitation in order to control and to excite the different kinds of materials that the researchers are interested in. And so this is meant to sort of give you a sense as to the complexity of the kinds of environments and systems that we use routinely here at the European XFEL. And we also then need a large amount of people who can be experts and who can take advantage of these various tools in order to do their research. And so we have a broad range of postdocs and PhD students, engineers and technicians and scientists. And of course, we work very closely with a large number of groups at the facility. And so you can think of this as being a very team-oriented operation. And so week to week, then our team will dynamically include researchers from around the world. And we make measurements such as scattering. So we look at X-ray diffraction or scattering off of solid state materials, usually to visualize dynamics, to follow the atoms as they move or the charge distribution in these materials. And we do a fair amount of biochemistry and chemistry systems where we're looking at changes in molecules or changes in proteins as they function or after they've been light activated. And so all of these things are then done on the order of femtoseconds or picoseconds, which are the timescales on which electrons and atoms move in these kinds of materials. Now, here are some examples of the kinds of large scale challenges that we're addressing with the, the broad range of research we do at the facility. And so one topic, which is obviously of importance to human health and life is water and access to clean water. And so one of the systems that we measured last year with uh, Julia Weinstein's group from the University of Sheffield was a photoactivated antibacterial agent. And so this is a copper molecule that you can put into solution. And when it absorbs light, you create singlet oxygen, which is then destructive to the bacterial um, components of your mixture. And so in order to understand exactly how this system works when it absorbs light, Julia and her team came to the facility in order to measure what was happening both in the structure and electronic environment of the copper atom after it absorbs light. We also do a fair amount of geology and geo geochemistry. And in this particular case, the goal was to investigate the conditions that are found closer to the center of the earth. And this is to look then for iron molten cores and how they behave um, under high intensity excitation and pressure. And so the goal was to reach regimes of the phase diagram that aren't achievable elsewhere and to take advantage of the high per pulse brilliance of the XFEL in order to probe these very transient states in order to understand what's happening 
at the Earth's core. We've also measured some um, insecticidal properties. And so this is a bacterial insecticide, which is in routine use for agriculture and medicine. And in this particular system, what happens is that um, it grows crystals within the, the stomach of the, of the insects. And when it does this, then this is obviously destructive to the insect. And in order to understand how this process occurs, we did crystallography and protein crystallography on these naturally occurring nanocrystals. And so the goal was to try to understand how this process happens and how these systems form within the proteins that make up this bacterial insecticide. This experiment here was to probe uh, the dynamics of ionizing radiation in water. And so in the upper atmosphere, where the, uh, there's a significant dose of UV and high energy photons, you can create these radical states where you have unpaired electrons. These are very reactive. And so you can create a broad range of photochemistry, some of which you'll be aware of, for example, with the ozone layer and the various uh, chlorofluorocarbons that were creating holes in it. And so the goal of this experiment was to understand how this ionizing radiation interacts with the water and exactly then how it behaves when we create these radical states. And so in this, the goal was to measure um, coincidence charged particles of electrons and, uh, and, char and uh, positively charged particles in order to better understand the fragmentation and the intramolecular dynamics of the water molecule when it breaks into pieces. And of course, this is occurring on very fast time scales. And so these elements are very light. And so you're looking for sort of femtosecond dynamics using your X-ray techniques. This is an example of a G protein coupled receptor, which is a protein that's found in the cell membrane. And these are often um, very reactive sites. So they are drug targets and they control a large amount of biochemistry. And so the goal was in order to understand how these systems function to perform crystallography on them. And this was a collaboration between the Sose Heptaris company and the European Expel in order to measure the structure of one of these GPCRs. And the interesting feature of GPCRs is that they do not um, form large crystals. And so they are not capable of being crystallized into large scale uh, crystals in order to be able to measure them, for example, using other techniques. This is an example of greener and more sustainable energy solutions, which was looking at a cobalt oxide crystal. And in this material, when you shine light on it, either blue light or red light, you get different excitation processes and you get different chemistry. And so the idea then is to understand how these photo excitation processes affect the photochemistry and the catalytic properties of this cobalt oxide material. And this was done in collaboration with Julia Mancini at the University of Pavia and Majed Chergi at EPFL. Now we're also interested in various kinds of magnetic materials. And so in this case, the material of, in question was an iron platinum mixture with very small domains. And this particular mixture, when you excite it, when you photo excite it, you launch a spin wave in the material. And so the idea was then to probe this spin wave dynamics and to understand exactly how you're changing the spins in these different domains after photo excitation. And so, of course, this means that you're working on very short and very fast scales. And so the, the concept is to understand how these materials function on an atomic level in order to be able to take advantage of them for future generations of storage devices. And this example here is to look at energy transport within strontium titanium oxide, which is a large band gap semiconductor. And in this particular case, when you make the very constrained uh, sort of large scale volumes of this material, you start to get interesting properties of it. And so the goal was to try to understand how the electronic excitation of this material propagates through it, and then also how to understand how heat transport is dissipated within it. And so you can see that in the example here, we have very short time scales, and we can see some structural dynamics which are occurring. And so the goal is to try to use this information to understand exactly how energy moves through this kind of material. So with that, I will wrap up and just mention that X-rays are clearly a very powerful tool. They complement your lab-based sources. They complement uh, a range of different measurements which can occur on different kinds of materials. And they're excellent at probing structure and probing electronic degrees of freedom in all sorts of different kinds of materials. In order to do these experiments, 
we need a large team as shown here from the staff photo of the European XFEL. And in order to work efficiently together, this means we need to work well as a team and we need to have efficient and reliable tools. And so the goal of obviously is to host researchers in an efficient way so that they come perform their experiments and then leave with their high quality data in as efficient a process as possible. And we're focused then on benefiting society through fundamental research or basic research technology development, since we're really working on the very boundaries of technology and also training young researchers. And so with that, I'd be happy to enter into any discussion or answer any questions you might have before Stefan takes over. Um, I actually have a question. Um, you know, you have you have showed us um, that there are many different experiments that can be done at Excel, no? But imagine there is a group that performs certain uh, research and then they think they can they can use Excel. Uh, for their experiments. So how can a group that never did any experiment at Excel can start preparing? What do they have to do? That's a really good question. So the simplest thing to do is to contact us at the European Excel. And so to get in touch um, through the through the web page is the most straightforward way and then start the discussion. And usually we can guide the researchers in the direction of understanding whether our tools would be appropriate to answer the scientific questions that they have, or perhaps to connect them to our colleagues, for example, at ESRF or at DAISY or at Ultrafast Laser Labs or using other methods to characterize their sample in order to help address the science that they would like to, to resolve. And the ability to perform experiments at an XFEL is challenging. And this is why having the support and the, the, the well-trained staff here is a significant benefit for researchers. And um, thinking about their samples, um, there might be some differences. So, so how they use or produce their samples and they usually characterize them at their labs. Uh, there might be, might be also a transition or, or an adaptation period on how to treat samples to be useful for for experience. yes, that's definitely true. I mean, as you can see with the one uh, the one video there that uh, that popped up, the ability to destroy the sample is crucial. And uh, so, if this is something where you know you have a limited amount or you have a small volume of it, then this is something where we would need to understand how best to deliver it into the beam to to perform the measurement. Uh, the, the measurements themselves are often well-defined, so we understand whether they should be in solution or they should be a thin stream of crystals or they should be deposited onto a thin film. And each of these things is something that is part of the, uh, the process of identifying how best to do the experiment. And so this would, be, this would be something that would occur naturally as part of the discussion about how to perform uh, an experiment at the European XFEL. So the message to go is that it's crucial actually to, to contact the scientists at Excel to start discussing how to accomplish an experiment. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. And we also are trying, I mean, we're, we're engaged. In fact, Stefan is leading this. We're engaged in a large amount of outreach and, uh, and discussions with uh, various research communities. Um, and so the, the idea of trying to get, uh, to get a discussion going in person at your host facility would also be something that would be interesting. Um, but the definite, the definite message is that we should just start a discussion to try to figure out what the best approach is to perform experiments.